Welcome to our lecture online. Nothing like examples to help us understand the material. And so here's one more example. In this case, we're going to have two power supplies and we have a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor. And just to move things along a little bit, I've already worked out the two mesh equations, mesh one and mesh two. We're going to go around each mesh in a clockwise direction. Notice starting from here, we have a voltage rise 40 volts, zero degree phase angle for the power supply. We have a voltage drop here, therefore the, ne the negative I1 times the resistance. And then we have a voltage drop across the capacitor relative to current I1. So it's I1, that's the voltage drop. I1 times a minus J2 because of the negative for the capacitor here. And then we have a voltage rise relative to I2, so it's plus I2 times minus J2. And then we simplify that. Now we start mesh two, starting from this corner. We have a voltage drop across the inductor, so minus I2 times J4. We have a voltage drop across the power supply because we go from the positive to the negative terminal, so it's minus 20 times the phase angle of 90 degrees. We have a voltage drop relative to I2, which is minus I2 times a minus J2, and a voltage rise relative to I1, so plus I1 times a negative J2. So if you do things very carefully like that, you're less likely to make mistakes. And oh yes, it is really easy to make mistakes here. So simplifying that, we have our second mesh equation. Now we have two equations and two unknowns. We have to somehow solve that for both I1 and I2. Now if we look carefully, in this equation, we have a minus J2 times I2, and in this equation, we have a minus J2 times I2. If we move this to the right side, we move this to the right side, so let me go ahead and circle that. So we take this and move that to the right side, and we take this here and we move that to the right side, then what's remaining, this should equal what's remaining in that equation, which means by doing that, we can say that 40 minus I1 multiplied times 8 minus J2 must equal, because that's the remaining part, we move that to the right side, must equal this and this combined. So we have I1 times minus J2, and then here we have minus J20. All right, so now notice, and this should be I1, I believe, right? Let's make sure that, yes, I1 and a minus J2. So now notice we have an equation with only I1 in it, so we could solve that for I1. So what we're going to do here is move uh, this to the other side and move this to the left side. So now we have minus I1 times eight minus J2. Move this across, so we have minus I1 times a minus J2 equals, move this across, we have a minus 40 minus J20. So now you can see that from both sides, we can, we can remove the negative one, so we can multiply the, the left side by negative one, the right side by negative one, which means we have left an eight minus J2 minus J2, that would be I1 times eight minus J4. So I multiply the left side by negative one, so the negative one disappears, equals, multiply the right side by negative one, we get 40 plus J20, which means that I1, is equal to 40 plus J20 divided by 8 minus J4. Now, to make that division, we probably want to convert that into the magnitude phase angle format. So let's go ahead and do that. 1600 plus 400, that's 2000. So we take 2000, take the square root, that's uh, 44.72. So 44.72 plus 400, with a phase angle of 20 divided by 4, that's 0.5, take the inverse tangent, that's 26.565 degrees. And in the denominator, we end up with uh, 64 plus 16, that's 80, so the square root of 80, which is 8.94, with a phase angle of, that's 4 divided by 8, that's 0.5 in the negative direction. That's the same, that would be minus 26.565 degrees. So that means that I1 is equal to, we have 44.72 divided by 8.94. That gives us, well, just about five. 
five with a phase angle of double that, that would be uh, 26.565 times two, that's, uh, yeah, that's 53.13 degrees. So now we have a value for I1, magnitude and phase angle. So now we can go ahead and do the same for I2. So I'm going to take this equation right here and solve that for I2. So I'm going to move that to the other side. So now we have I2 times J2 is equal to, on the left side, what we have remaining is a minus I1 multiplied times a minus J2. Let's see here. Um, well, I guess I, I pulled the negative out, so I'll write it like this, J2, like this. And then on that side, I have a minus 20. Uh, J, minus J20. There we go. So we have a minus J20 on the left side. We have a minus I1 J2 on the left, on the left side. So we move that to the right side. And then we have I2 J2 that we move to the other side equal sign. So basically I switched the equation around. So now I can divide both sides by J2. When we do that, we have I2 is equal to minus I1 J2 divided by J2 is 1, and minus J20 divided by J2 would be a minus 10, because the J's cancel out. All right, so I2 is minus I1 minus 10. So I have to take this and convert that into uh, the real imaginary parts. So we have 5 times, well, let's see here, 53.13, take the cosine of that, which is 0 0.6, times 5, which is 3. So that leaves me with... A real part of 3 uh, plus j, and it looks like uh, the 53.13 take the sine of that, that's 0.8, that would be plus j4, like that. So i1 is equal to this, i2 is equal to this, minus 10. So i2 is equal to minus i1, which is 3, plus j4, minus 10, so that would be equal to minus 13 plus Oh, not plus, but minus J4, minus 13, minus J4. And so now, when we convert that back to, I, I like to write it like this, minus 13 plus J4. And now we can go ahead and write that back in magnitude and uh, phase angle format. So we have a 13 and 4. So 13 squared plus 16. Take the square root. That gives us 13.6. So minus 13.6 with a phase angle of 4 divided by 13. Take the inverse tangent, that would be 17.1 degrees. So now we have I2 and we have I1. Just in case, I might as well write that in the magnitude and, well, I have it already. It's right here, so I don't have to do that anymore. There we go. So now we've found I1. And I too, and I'm beginning to run out of board space, so what I'm going to do next is do part two. And in part two, we're going to find the voltages across each of the components. Those two we already have, so we have to do the voltage across those three components. And then we can calculate the average power, either provided or uh, absorbed by, any, by all five of the components. So let's go ahead and do that. So that will be part two.